In this lesson, we are going to discuss locating and measuring earthquakes. At the end of this video lesson, you should be able to use the information from seismic waves to locate and measure earthquakes and describe the relationship of the epicentral distance and magnitude of shaking. Earthquakes are located and measured using a seismograph. It is an equipment that detects the shaking of the earth in the form of seismic waves. Once the seismograph detects vibrations, a graph will be created in the form of a seismogram. This graph gives a picture of the behavior of the seismic waves. The arrival of an earthquake is evident on the drastic fluctuations in the seismogram. In this part of the seismogram, we can see the smaller and weaker vibrations. These are the body waves. These waves travel through the interior of the earth as they leave the focus. These body waves are divided into two types. The first to arrive is called the primary waves. It will have a temporary weakening and will drastically be recorded again as the secondary waves. These two types of waves can be analyzed like how toy slingies behave. If a slingy is being pushed and pulled, it depicts the longitudinal motion of primary waves. But if a slinky is played vertically, it depicts a transverse motion of secondary waves. Another important thing to take note as a point of difference for the two types of body waves is the medium of propagation. Primary waves can pass through solid and liquid regions of the Earth's interior. This means that these waves pass through both the mantle and core but are slowed and refracted at the discontinuities. On the other hand, secondary waves can only pass through solid regions of the Earth's interior. This means that if a seismic wave originating from the mantle radiates, it will just be absorbed in the outer core since the layer is liquid. If the seismic waves radiate going to the surface, it will be trapped just beneath the surface of the Earth and will appear as the stronger vibrations. Let us look at the previous seismogram to look at this type of wave. These stronger waves are called the surface waves. The shorter and faster surface waves are called the love waves. And the longer and slower surface waves are called the Rayleigh waves. Let us further compare the two types of surface waves. As seen in this animation, the particle or ground motion is parallel to the free surface. This means that there is a horizontal shifting. Just like the S waves, love waves cannot also pass through liquids. This is the cause of the damage on buildings and the shearing of the ground. On the other hand, as seen in the animation from the Rayleigh waves, the ground behaves like ocean waves. This shows perpendicular shaking. This causes circular motion of the ground. This is evident when the ground moves up and down during earthquakes. The surface and body waves are used to locate and measure earthquakes. Let us first discuss the process of locating the earthquake epicenter through earthquake triangulation. This is a technique which uses at least three seismographs that would give information on the epicentral distances of the locations. There are three general steps in earthquake triangulation. These are getting the SP time difference in each location, getting the epicentral distance from the SP time difference, and drawing the radius of the epicentral distance for the purpose of identifying the intersection or the actual epicenter. To further understand the process of locating earthquake epicenters by earthquake triangulation, we are going to look at an earthquake which happened in Chile. Since we need at least three locations, we are going to use seismograms from Santiago, Talca, and Osorno. Let us first look at the seismogram from Santiago. We knew that the first step is getting the SP time interval or difference. To get this, we should be able to properly identify and differentiate the primary waves from the secondary waves. The P waves which are the first fluctuations in the seismogram were recorded at time zero in the seismogram. It will slowly weaken and will increase abruptly which signals the entry of the S wave which is at 35th second record in the seismogram. Since we are getting the interval between the two waves, we just subtract the arrival time of the P waves from the arrival time of S waves. This gives us 35 seconds. For the second location, which is Talca, the P waves arrived at time 0. The S waves arrived at time 15. Therefore, our SP interval is 15 seconds. For the last location, which is Osorno, the P waves arrived at time 0. The S waves arrived at time 59. Therefore, our SP time interval is 59 seconds. Now that we have the SP time intervals for the three locations, we can now obtain their epicentral distances. To do this, we are going to use the SP interval graph. We need the SP time intervals from the previous part and look for their positions on the y-axis of the graph. Let us look at Talca first. Talca has an SP time interval of 15 seconds. 
we are going to draw a line going to the right until it reaches the diagonal line. This signals the point in which we will change our reading downwards. The reading on the x-axis will give us the epicentral distance for the location. In this case, Talca has a 140 km radial distance from the epicenter. For Santiago, its epicentral distance is 340 km. Lastly, for Osorno, its epicentral distance is 580 km. We can also use the equation of the diagonal line in the graph to get the epicentral distance from the SB time interval. This line has an equation of d is equal to time multiplied to 10 minus 10. The letter d here symbolizes the distance of the location from the epicenter. Let us try to solve for the epicentral distance of Talca. Since it has an SP time interval of 15 seconds, we are going to have 15 times 10 minus 10 or 150 minus 10. This gives us a 140 km epicentral distance for Talca. Since we already have the epicentral distances for the three locations, we can now locate the epicenter on the map. When using digital mapping tools, automation is expected. But if it will be manually done, the scaling of a compass depending on the map scale is necessary. This map shows the different epicentral distances which were drawn using the radius for each location. This shows that at this point is the epicenter of the earthquake. This map also shows the importance of using at least three locations. If you only use two locations, we will have two intersections. And this ends earthquake triangulation. Now, let us discuss measuring earthquakes. Earthquakes can be measured using its intensity or Mercalli scale. Earthquakes can also be measured using the magnitude or the Richter scale. The former is the measure of an earthquake's effect on people and buildings which makes intensity measurements subjective and different on different location. This is due to the distance, ground type, construction materials, and the sensitivity of people in experiencing earthquakes. On the other hand, magnitude is the measure of the energy release at the earthquake's focus. Two locations experiencing the same earthquake will have the same magnitude because magnitude is measured at the earthquake's focus and not per location. Also, unlike intensity, magnitude is objective and uses based on logarithm. This means that an earthquake with a magnitude which is one level higher is 10 times stronger than the earthquake magnitude below it. This also means that a magnitude 8 earthquake is not twice as strong as a magnitude 4 earthquake. Since a magnitude 8 earthquake is 4 times higher than a magnitude 4 earthquake in the Richter scale, it is 10,000 times stronger than the other earthquake. Now, let us discuss the steps on how to determine the magnitude of an earthquake. In measuring earthquake magnitudes, we first need to identify the amplitude of the seismic wave. After that, we are going to use the Richter nomogram to connect the relationship of the distance and the amplitude. In this procedure, one earthquake record is enough to obtain the magnitude, but more records would result to a more accurate conclusion of the magnitude. Let us now look at the amplitudes of the same locations which experienced the earthquake in Chile. The amplitude is the longest part of the wave regardless if it is found on the upper or lower half. For Santiago, its amplitude is at 60 mm. For Talca, its amplitude is 460 mm. And lastly, for Osorno, its amplitude is 9 mm. Plotting the following epicentral distance and amplitudes on the Richter nomogram, we can now get the magnitude of the earthquake. Let us first connect the information from Talca as seen in the red dots. This gives us a magnitude of 5.9. For checking purposes, let us look at Santiago and Osorno. This data shows that regardless of the location of the earthquake, the same magnitude will be recorded since it came from one focus only. And aside from that, we can see that the closer the location to the epicenter, the stronger the earthquake will be felt. Now, to summarize this lesson, let us review the following key points. The P and S waves travel through the interior of the Earth. Love and Rayleigh waves travel on the surface of the Earth. The SP time difference of at least three different locations are required to determine an earthquake epicenter. And lastly, the amplitude and distance from the epicenter are required to determine the earthquake's magnitude. And that ends our discussion on locating and measuring earthquakes.